Welcome to the Nestle Nutrition Institute Education Series. This program is one of many developed to bring contemporary nutrition topics to healthcare professionals. It's interesting, when I made this lecture, you know, they asked me if I'd come and give some basic science about absorption. Absorption, digestion. I go, well, these people are all trained in nutrition. I mean, what do you want me to do? And they go, well, you know, we, we need to go over the basics so we're all in the same setting. So when we talk about the next two people, then we can pull it all together. So I said, okay. So I pulled together some of the texts I give to the medical students. I teach the absorption, digestion part for our medical school. And that brings up some interesting topics, but we'll kind of go from there. But remember, when you talk about the GI tract, we talk about injury to the GI tract or stress response to the GI tract. So you can see we get into this concept of anything that really sets off the cascade. This cascade of really decreasing cardiac output, increased catecholamines, hypovolemia, all that comes together with our end result being splenic hypoperfusion, whether we're shunting blood away or we have inadequate volume in our vessels. But really, this used to be, when I first made this slide many years ago, I had three things across here. But as we learn more and more, those three are becoming more, and I'm gonna run out of space here, because now we have to talk about the microbiome. What happens to the microbiome? Virtually everything we do affects the microbiome. That's my area of research now. You know, you see all these things here, altered GI motility, mucosal barrier function, mucos, mu, reduced mucosal blood flow all resulting, if we don't correct it, in you know, distant organ failure in organs. So if we look at the mucosal anatomy, you know, we're gonna go through the real basics now. We'll start back. You know, the folds of Kirkering or pleque circularis, as we see, where remember the key to this proximal small bowel and even distal small bowel is increasing our surface area. With these folds, we increase our surface area about tenfold. The microvilla then increase it 20-fold on top of that. So the end result, is having the surface area on your intestine about half the size of this room. When you lay it all out, so you can think about that, throwing a bunch of nutrients on that can rapidly be absorbed. We know now we need about 100 centimeters to survive without parental nutrition. We do that routinely in our clinic. We see people, we always say, what were they left with? We read the op notes and we say, what were they left with? You know, and that's the key, is how much they've got to play with, not how much they took out. I don't care if you took out 30 or 40 centimeters. I want to know what you took out and where. So we need 100 centimeters. The normal length is about 22 feet. But remember, this depends if you're doing your, doing your measuring at the autopsy table, where there's no muscular tissue left, no contraction, or at the bedside, or at the fresh autopsy before they've had time to stretch out. You know, the, from the ligament trites really is what we usually measure to the ileocecal valve, it's about 400 centimeters. So we've got a, obviously a fourfold redundancy in how much we need because, of, you know, we've probably evolved to getting more and more concentrated nutrients. We no longer need to 400 centimeters, but we have 400 centimeters in case. So women uh, have about, you know, 500 centimeters, 590, and men about 630. And those are from some of the autopsy studies in the early 50s and 60s. The biggest autopsy series showing about 450 is from the Vietnam War, where they autopsied everybody injured. Okay, when we start looking at this different small bowel segments, remember proximity, we have duodenum, obviously, that as soon as we get in the, into the peritoneal cavity, per se, we have jejunum, and then distally we have ileum. If you have to lose part of your intestine, you want to lose mid-small bowel. Okay, you don't want to mess with the duodenum because it's near the pancreas, okay? And so mid-small bowel, you can pretty much take out with impunity as long as you maintain some ileum because ileum can do everything the rest of the intestine can do, but it also can do bile salts and B12. The rest of the intestine cannot do bile salts and B12. Okay, so that's the big key there. Now, the real action is at the tip of the mucosa. Remember, if we look at one of these microvilli, uh, we go here, we know the first third of that is a secretory portion. And this becomes important when we talk about how do we start feeding people. Remember, the first third of this is a secretory epithelium or secretory tissue, and then the tips are where the absorption takes place. But really, it's not exposure directly to the tip of the mucosa because we've got a beautiful layer of mucus. This is basically 
what's going on there. All these little proteins or glycoproteins are sitting there off these microvilli. And you can see if things are going down there, it's just like a river. In the middle, you may have a very deep section if we're going very fast, but on the sides where there's lots of weeds and brush and things, things slow down and that's where the absorption takes place. So with our traumas and critical care and injury and chemotherapy, what happens? We denude all this stuff that slows things down to let the real terminal digestion take place. And that's the key there. We don't allow it to get down to here. And also that's when the injury and that's when the bacterial overgrowth takes place. That's when the bacteria, the microbiome can start to affect the mucosa more. That's why we know some are better than others on rebuilding that intestine. So those tips are the key. This is the brush border, so to speak, where the action of the enzymes take place for absorption into that villus. So now if we look at that, remember, not only do you have to worry about the intestine, we've got to keep in mind the GI tract has got the pancreas and, and biliary tree involved. And we know that about 50% of ICU patients have all abnormal biliary secretions or pancreatic secretions. I think a key thing here is what happens in the transition. So for example, if you drink a Coca-Cola, it has a milliosmol of about 500. Okay, so when that hits the stomach, the stomach says that's way too much sugar to dump into the intestine. So the body is then required to dilute that. It dilutes it by about half. So your 208 ounce Coke at 254 cc's now is about 750 to 500 to 1,000 to 500 cc's, or 500, about 500 cc's. So now you've got to somehow handle 500 cc's because you made that volume in half and you put a bunch of sodium in there. Now you can start to think about resorbing, but what happens? It, so that 500 cc's now, okay, goes to duodenum where we have to now secrete more sodium in there to get the sodium up to where it can reabsorb. And now that 250 has become 750. That's why people with our proximal fistulas you know, fistulas up in the first 50 to 75 centimeters, we know those people are gonna require TPN. And we know they've got to drink only isotonic fluids because of the issues with we're gonna cause more secretion, more loss. People say, gee, I only took in five sips today, but I put out a liter. I go, yeah, well, that's all the other issues going on. It's hard concept to understand. But so by the first 40 or 50 centimeters of jejunum, now we've got almost 1,000 cc's. But now look, now the sodium's up. Now we can start to say, okay, now it's time to start sucking it all back in. So by the ileum, we're down to 750. By the distal ileum, we're back to about 350 or 400. And then of course the colon does a real job of pulling in the fluid. And so then we end up with about 200 cc's of fluid. So as you can see, the fluid flux across the GI tract is tremendous. It's gone back and forth, back and forth until we get to the, to the rectum and anus. And we, we have about two to 300 cc's a day, about two liters a day hit the jejunum, but about five to seven liters a day hit the proximal GI tract. Okay, so I think that's the key. We gotta remember this as a flux. Carbohydrate digestion mostly takes place out in that fuzzy area we showed you on those, on those uh, scanning EMs. Complex carbohydrates are digested out there. They're basically brought down in the, through amylase, the maltose, maltotriose, lactose, and sucrose, okay? Remember, lactose goes to <coughs> lactose and glucose. They go through the SGLI-1 transporter, and that's the majority of it. That's an ATPase-dependent, sodium-dependent transport. That's the key, okay? So that gets into the cell and pumps it out here. The energy for that, the electrical energy that allows us to absorb those across a like, gradient, is right here, sodium potassium ATPase. That generates that, mild, that electrical difference, okay, the potential then to draw the glucose in, and then we know fructose is by passive diffusion. Okay, so the main ones, of course, are glucose and galactose. So if we look at that, here's where we see it. You can see sodium-dependent glucose transport, and it's sodium potassium ATPase, the basal lateral membrane, produces the electrochemical gradient that allows that energy to take place. So there's always this flux. That's why the sodium is critical to get in up front. What about amino acid absorption? Here's where the reaction takes place. We have the, we have the gastric phase and we have the intestinal phase. You can see pepsin here takes down our peptides. Remember, pepsin doesn't really cleave it much. Pepsin unravels the disulfide bonds, it unravels the tertiary structure of the protein. So now you've got a big chain you can start to cleave with the pancreatic enzymes. 
So pepsin, we do well without pepsin because it just takes a little longer to digest. But you can, we take stomachs out all the time. Okay, so then we go to the pancreas. You can see all these peptides that are broken down by either carboxypeptidases that come in from the end or endopeptidases that cleave it up in the middle. So now we're breaking that up into small peptides and single amino acids, okay? That all is taking place during the intestinal phase. And here's where we didn't know until the 80s that in fact most of our diet, most of our protein in our diet is taken up by the peptide transporter. 70% of the protein you eat is taken up by the peptide transporter. Two and three amino acid peptides, very rapid transporter, a very non-selective transporter. You can see then they're going into the portal blood there. Remember, when they're taken up as a diatripeptide, they're cleaved here, cytosolic uh, peptides, and cleaves those into single amino acids. A few dipeptides get across, but not too many, and single amino acids enter the portal blood. Okay? Now, if we look at that, transport system. It again is sodium dependent co-transport. So we need that mild, that electrical chemical gradient. Okay, we have some basic single amino acid transporter. Prior to discovery of the peptide transported by Fred Leibach and Vivid Onganopathy in 1981, people said, the physicist told us there's no physical way someone with 100 centimeters left, there's no possible way they can absorb all their nutrient. There has to be an ability to absorb multiple peptides at the same time. So then they discovered, Fred and Vivek uh, uh, and Ganapathy discovered that and showed us easily through multiple very, very nice work. I was surprised they didn't win, get nominated for Nobel Prize work, but very beautiful work basically showing us that. It's a non-specific transporter. If you think about that, you've got, you've got 20 protein amino acids. You've got 8,000 combinations, right? If you take 20 and it could be any ratio, it'll take up 8,000 different combinations, so a very nonspecific transporter. But also our drugs, our cephalosporins. The GI tract, the peptide transporter, oh, that looks like an amino acid, I'll take it, okay? Our antiretrovirals all go through the peptide transporter. They think, oh, it's a nonspecific, it looks like an amino acid, I'll take it. A lot of the things we take up in our GI tract is because it takes up to there. And here's that system. Remember, so basically here, the peptide transport is a hydrogen potassium ATPase. You can see there, dipeptide, tripeptides, the majority going through here, broken up in the cell, and then into the portal vein. Okay, does it matter where the protein comes from? Well, we know that if we look at nitrogen balance studies and peptide studies and tracer studies, net protein utilization, net protein uptake in the body appears to be in the sick patient a little bit better for the, pro, for the animal-based proteins, whey, casein, et cetera. But again, you can do well in normal GI tract does fine with animal proteins or with non-animal proteins. So you can say that it depends a lot on digestibility, you know, what's going on at the brush border and those kind of things. This is all the different ways we measure Protein utilization, you know, a net protein utilization, amino acid score, biological value. And so we have different ways to measure it, which bring into that digestibility, absorbability, and things like that. Lipids, remember lipids? We used to think lipids are just for a good caloric source. They're rapidly taken up and we gotta get fat soluble vitamins with those. But now we know the lipids are probably much more important than we ever figured out because of lipid rafts and receptor function that are required for our lipids. And now we talk about not just essential fatty acids, but all the effects on the genes and everything else that go, takes place. When we think about lipids, we can not only think about medium and long chain fats. We've got to think about short chain fatty acids, butyrate now produced in the colon from, di from fermentation of soluble fibers is key. And this meeting is just full of articles on the effects of butyrate and microbiome because then again the microbiome comes into play. Okay, the MCT is critical because remember, we can get an MCT, a medium chain triglycerides, eight to 14 amino acids into the mitochondria for oxidation without a carrier. And as we know that fat metabolism goes down in critical illness because the inability to transport a long chain fat into the mitochondria. So now medium chain triglycerides don't require that carrier. So it's a good solution to have MCT is a good option to have in your critical care formulas. 
So here we got micelle formation. This is fat digestion again. Two fatty acids. Remember that triglyceride. The one and three positions are cleaved off. And a two monoglyceride is taken up into the cell. And the other fatty acids are taken up separately. Now here's the key there. They're re-esterified in that cell. Okay, they're put back together as a triglyceride. So they're broken down, transported in, put back together, and then if they're long chain, they go to the chylomicron system. If they're medium chain, they go to the portal vein. Dual absorptive systems, we play that and use that. So remember, then once they're in the lacteals, they, go to, they collect in the cisterna chyli, cross up, go through the diaphragm and the thoracic duct go up the right side, transfer to the right side about T5, go up to the neck, and they enter the central circulation. Many people argue this is the way we see toxins, and why ARDS is the first organ always gone in severe injury, because toxic lymph gets into the, into the thoracic duct and goes directly to the lung. Okay. So as we clu and close up here, number of absorbed and nutrients is complex. We've got numerous considerations. We've got motility, mucosal integrity, and you saw the thickness of that GI tract goes in very important, that brush bordillary, blood flow is a key, osmolarity, all these factors come into play on how we decide on a formula, okay? Remember, acute trials in healthy individuals where much of the basic physiology is done does not work in the ICU. It takes a lot longer to understand what's going on in the ICU. It's been a long road. We've got off on some tangents, but we're back in the mainstream now. We're learning more and more. We've got tracer technology now, which is in the last seven to 10 years, has really shown us a lot about absorption, which is completely new. And we're learning more about the transporters on a daily basis. All right, well, thank you uh, for joining us again. And I just wanna um, get, a, get a raise of hands of how many of you see outpatients? Some. Okay, <laughs> so um, you know, I wanted to shift from the inpatient side, especially the critical care side, to the outpatient side, and I think this is where nutrition research is really lacking. Uh, so the few of us that see outpatients, uh, we really need to band together and, and ask for more and more research. Uh, these are my disclosures, um, and what I'd like to do is present a case for most of you who don't see outpatients, of how difficult the outpatient practice can be and what the challenges are, um, and, and some of the techniques that we then utilize to help these patients uh, meet their energy goals. So I'll give this as an example. So this is a 50-year-old uh, female that we were asked to assist with nutrition support on the outpatient side. Uh, and at the time we were seeing her, she had a history of a Nissen fundoplication. Uh, she had severe reflux. And so in 1999, went through this Nissen fundoplication, but then came back uh, in 2013, and all of her symptoms had returned. So at that time, she also was obese and had a number of comorbidities of obesity. Um, and when a workup was done, they found that the Nissen fundoplication was coming apart. She also had developed a small hiatal hernia as well at that time. So the decision was made to uh, transition her to a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. This is a fast-growing trend in many patients, especially in those obese. Nissen fundoplications are no longer being done, and they're being uh, transitioned to Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. But after undergoing this procedure, unfortunately, she returned a few months later and at that point reported uh, recurrent abdominal pain. She said the pain was happening 10, 15 minutes after a meal. So when we start to think about this, you know, this is happening early on, so you start to look at the anatomy and say, what could be going on? Is there an ulcer developing? Is she developing a stenosis? Or even more commonly, is she eating the right way for her new anatomy. This is one of our biggest challenges in trying to get patients to do well with bariatric surgery is the post-operative diet. And so that's where we started in this situation, changing how she consumed the food, uh, separating fluids from meals, decreasing use of straws. You know, you could suck up a lot of air, and when you have a small stomach, that can cause a lot of problems. But unfortunately, this didn't help uh, as much as we thought. 
So then we pursued a full workup, upper GI uh, was done, and there they noted that this uh, GJ anastomosis was patent, but there was a deformity in the gastric pouch. EGD was done, and that showed that the gastric pouch was in fact distended. Normally this is around 15 milliliters in volume, and this was way more than 20. What was also happening is that this connection to the jejunum was a little bit higher. So she was essentially filling the pouch and then it would drain in and she would have to do these manipulations for the food to kind of move forward. Um, so based on these findings, you know, took her back to the OR and revised her procedure. But as they were doing this, they also found a lot of scarring uh, from that Nissen fundoplication and so essentially had to do esophago jejunostomy. So couldn't create a gastric pouch again. So you could see how tough these uh, procedures are. But unfortunately, that didn't, that didn't solve the, the problem. She then continued to have abdominal pain, gas, and bloating. Um, a, a CT was done, and there was some injury to the pancreas during the operation. So they found a little bit of fluid collection, um, and she was admitted for observation. There was no hints of infection, and so that was managed conservatively, but she kept having the abdominal pain and the symptoms. Now she was also having nausea and vomiting. So EGD was done, and they said, well, maybe there's, there's a stenosis there. Let's dilate and see if that helps, but it didn't. And her weight kept going down. So at this point, you know, we have, we have to decide. I mean, the weight's going down. She's not able to meet her nutritional needs. She's also miserable. Um, and so what should we do next? You know, do we try to refocus on dietary modifications? Do we try enteral feeds at this time? And then if we do, how do we do it? Through a nasal jejunal tube, remnant uh, stomach, or do we say enteral oral's not gonna work, we need TPN? So in our case, you know, we relied on, on the multitude of studies, especially in the critical care settings, that show that if the gut works, it's best to use it. And so that, these are just a list of all the benefits you get from enteral feeds uh, compared to parenteral nutrition. Uh, there's also this great study by Dr. McClave. Um, it's kind of an older study uh, where they looked at enteral versus parenteral. So they randomized 30 patients with pancreatitis uh, to essentially enteral using a semi-elemental formula through NJ versus parenteral calories and protein were kept the same, and uh, these were some of their findings. In terms of reaching goal calories, pretty much no statistical difference. Amylase lipase decreased, no major difference. But I wanna highlight this. One, there are some trends showing benefit to enteral nutrition, but this is something we forget. You know, and, and yesterday we heard in the opening uh, uh, statement kind of that healthcare utilization is a big responsibility almost for us. And we, we forget that, that part of it in that there's significant cost to parenteral nutrition compared to enteral. So with this, uh, we decided to feed into the remnant stomach. So she underwent placement of a G-tube into the remnant stomach. We thought this would offer her a lot more options than a nasal jejunal. Uh, we were uh, you know, a little bit shy of going down the jejunostomy route as well. So then the next question is, well, how do we feed her? Do we do a standard polymeric formula? Do we do fiber, no fiber, high protein formula? Do we try a semi-elemental formula right from the beginning? Or many of you are probably saying enteral's not going to work, just go to TPN. But we weren't you know, giving up. We wanted to go down the enteral route. And this just orients you to what are some of the major differences between these formulas. And as Dr. Martindale uh, kind of alluded to, um, as we absorb these uh, standard polymeric formulas, they have intact protein. Carbohydrates tend to be complex carbohydrates. Lipids tend to be long-chain triglycerides. When we start to move into the semi-elemental, uh, they're really peptides. So some of that digestin has been pre-done, so you get amino acid chains of varying length. Lipids also are more medium-chain triglycerides, sometimes even 70%. And then the elemental formulas are even more broken down. So our approach, 
was to try the high protein because of obesity. Um, we also were thinking along the lines of supplemental enteral. She was still eating, and we wanted enteral to be a bridge uh, just so that she could go back to eating. We didn't think this was going to be long term. So that's where we started, but right away she called back and said she's bloated. She now has worse abdominal pain. It's different. It feels like an ice pick is sort of moving in her belly, uh, and she's also constipated. So at this point, we're like, oh boy, what do we do next? You know, do we try some for, uh, fiber because she's constipated? Do we add pancreatic enzymes? Do we switch to semi elemental, change to TPN? And so our approach was to try the fiber first and see if that, that would help. We also changed how she provided the formula, but again, no help. And you can see healthcare utilization. This is a big, big component of this in that she's calling all the time, right? She, she's not happy, she's reaching out. She also goes to the ER. They do a CT scan. So you can imagine that yearly budget of enteral nutrition just went out the window with just this one visit and a CT scan. So that's something we, we have to keep in mind. Um, so at this point, we start to look for other approaches. Fiber didn't work, um, you know. And one of those approaches that, that gets brought up quite a bit is to use pancreatic enzymes. So I, I think of it in the same bucket as well of healthcare and also patient resources. Uh, so with, with pancreatic enzymes compared to uh, using a semi-elemental formula, uh, here, so standard polymeric with pancreatic enzyme versus semi-elemental formula, in the cystic fibrosis patients, there was no major difference between absorption. But when I think about this, I think about our patients taking the pancreatic enzymes, and you have to make sure they take it in the beginning, middle, end of their feeds. Um, you know, are they gonna do that multiple times per day? What is that life like for them uh, compared to if we were just to use a, a semi-elemental formula? So that also goes into the thought process. We still, we're, we're pretty stubborn, you know, so we still were thinking we can make this work. Let's try, you know, same formula with fiber, but let's try continuous feeds overnight. Uh, maybe if she's asleep, she won't get the pain. Uh, but it didn't work. So she still kept having pain. So then we said, well, maybe it's the oral intake. Let's hold off on that and just try enteral nutrition. Maybe start slowly and see what we can do. And again, uh, it doesn't work. You can see this is what outpatient is like, uh, you know, so still continues to complain of gas, bloating, abdominal pain. We adjust the formula again, doesn't work. She sees a gastroenterologist, so again, that healthcare utilization. Uh, they focus, the workup is negative, things look good, so they focus more on the constipation and say, uh, maybe we try a bowel regimen and that will work. We again try to focus on oral intake, that doesn't work. Even the tube is changed, um, but unfortunately nothing works. She's still losing weight. So now just in our watch, you know, she's down another seven, almost 8% of her body weight. So finally we say, well, let's, we, we should try semi-elemental formula, and so we transition her to that. Uh, start at pretty much the same rate as she was before, and then gradually increase this. And this is the message we get. You know, by this time, we all have PTSD from the messages saying, <laughs> do we open this today? No, I'm not in a good place, I'll wait. Um, but this time when we open the message, she says, you know, I'm very pleased to be writing this note today. Uh, I've been on my new formula uh, since getting it in the mail. Um, I've been trying out different rates, and those are working really well. Um, symptoms of pain, bloating, gassiness, and general feeding difficulties have all but resolved. Uh, I really feel that all the changes that were made definitely show great benefit, and I'm so, so happy. So, you know, this is the best part of kind of being a, a physician or a provider uh, for these patients. And so this also sort of prompted us to look at other patients that we've dealt with and see what our experience has been like. So we uh, did a retrospective review of uh, patients who were placed on peptide-based formulas 
from January 2016 all the way to May 2018, uh, and we had 98 of them. And they broke up into two buckets. Essentially, there were 55 patients who were started right away uh, on a peptide-based formula. 43 of them were switched from another formula. And these were some of their characteristics. So you could see no major difference in age. Um, uh, in, in the switched patients, they tended to be a little bit more female um, and weight, there was slight difference. Uh, but these were their primary diagnoses. And here you can see many of the ones that were started early on tended to favor sort of this pancreatic, you know, whether it's a surgery or pancreatitis. So people felt there was more component of malabsorption, and that's why they started them on peptide base right away. Whereas these other folks, especially neurological, like our stroke patients, they tended to get the polymeric, standard polymeric formula from the beginning. Um, these were some of the indications, um, and, and no major differences there that we saw. And this was the indication for peptide-based formula. So we reviewed the notes and, and tried to understand what was uh, the prescriber or the provider thinking. And, and as I've mentioned, uh, really that component of fat malabsorption was what they were thinking about when they started the patients right away. As opposed to those who were switched, there the reason for switching most of the time was intolerance. Okay, these were sort of the formulas, and here I did have to use the names because just to orient you uh, to the formulas that were used. Um, and then most of the time it was continuous feeding. Uh, some cases we were successful in using intermittent feeding. But then this is sort of that tolerance component. Most actually did quite well on the peptide-based formula. So these were the folks that were started on peptide-based diets, and you can see that symptoms do continue to arise. That's just a normal part of our enteral nutrition practice, but many patients uh, had no symptoms whatsoever. But to me, really, it's those individuals that were transitioned to peptide-based diet where we saw the major differences. And so here, almost, almost a 50% reduction in complaints of nausea vomiting after the switch. Um, almost a 50% reduction in diarrhea, and the same thing for abdominal cramping uh, and pain. You could see a dramatic drop there, and a, almost a doubling in patients, or more than a doubling of patients after the switch having no, no symptoms. But then here's where we see that they were able to get a little bit more calories. We were able to meet their goals, protein goals, and average duration in feeds, we were quite successful in prolonging those. Uh, but going back to that healthcare utilization, I think this is the crux of something that we tend not to take into account when we're making some of these medical decisions, but perhaps we, we really should. Um, and you can see that here in terms of healthcare utilization, but especially in those that were switched. Um, patients, on, on average, called about half as much as they did before. So that's pretty dramatic for a practice like ours where even a small reduction can lead to you know, hundreds of less phone calls. So that's, that's pretty uh, you know, important. Then this is the big one, ER visits. A dramatic reduction there. And also you can see a dramatic reduction in terms of average number of visits to our clinic as well. So based on this, you know, peptide-based formulas have kind of become uh, a, a one of the things that we, we now commonly use for patients who are having intolerance to other uh, formulas. For you, Laszlo. So I noticed you got this patient through this disaster on adult ECMO, which is becoming more common today. But then when he left to go home, or before he left, he would put on a lower protein formula. Why'd you go down? Isn't the current trend to get, continue giving protein? Well, I think the, the, you have to look at the time frames. This is six weeks out from his, yeah, from his illness. Yeah, why not for a year? Give it for a Well, I don't, I don't think we have that. And then remember, we're kind of, he just resolved his renal failure. And my point is that he's resolved his inflammatory processes. 
And I don't think there's an indication to be at that very high protein range once you resolve your inflammatory processes, you resolve your organ failure, and you're really in this outpatient recovery mode. Okay, all right. That's fine. Sounds reasonable. Question? Yes. Yeah, hi. This is a question from uh, post-acute care. So we get the patients direct from ICU. And I'd like someone to explain the detail in terms of we typically get patients from one hospital that uses a different formulary. It's a peptide-based formula. And they always have a rectal tube or a fecal man management device. So what we do is we are a non-rectal tube facility, so we remove the fecal management device, change the formula to our peptide-based formula, and within, I'd say, about seven days, um, we also use soluble fiber with that, uh, we can correct the problems with severe diarrhea. So it just seems that it's important to just, and I don't want to put anybody on the spot, I understand the political aspect of this, but there's a big difference in peptide base um, formulas, the fat composition. There's something that's so remarkable that we have case after case after case of showing such a huge difference in GI tolerance. I think it's good. Anybody up? Got any thoughts on that? I mean, the only other thing is that um, I think the ICU gets, they get blamed sometimes. Sometimes it's, it's appropriate. But then once they transition to the ICU, I think tolerant, intolerance of feeding is high in the ICU. And so as you transition, like you said, out of the ICU, yes, you see some differences. And some of the differences, I think, may also be explained by the change in the patient's condition, because they're more likely to tolerate it once that acute inflammatory process is resolved. I think, remember, the peptide transporter is the, is the first one to go and the first one to come back. We've got great data out of Japan that shows how fast the transporters come back, and the peptide transporter is the first transporter back after a major insult to the GI tract. That was done with chemotherapy. Yes, the question. Um, I have a question to Dr. Manpreet. Um, so in the presented case, um, why didn't you aim for the peptide formula straight away? Why didn't you want to? It, it's a great question, and I think the retrospective study showed that more than anything. Um, when we looked at you know close to 100 patients, um, we realized that why are we struggling so much to transition them sooner? Uh, it was more of we should try to make the standard polymeric work, try fiber, try all these other interventions, and you saw it prolonged the care for months and resulted in significant healthcare utilization. So now, you know, we're much, uh, we, we act much sooner uh, and switch them to like a peptide-based diet. Um, Just one more question. Um, did you consider uh, going for jejunal feeding uh, from the beginning or? The jejunal feeding, we, we absolutely considered it. Uh, where we had apprehension was in discussion with our surgeons who, had, who knew the belly. And they said that because of all the adhesions and the scarring, eventual jejunostomy would be much, much harder. And so they felt that easier approach would be to start in the remnant gas, uh, you know, the remnant stomach. Right. So that's why that, that was made. Thank you. I think in these post bariatric patients, we see a lot of maldigestion, not malabsorption. Mm -hmm. It's a timing issue. You know, and that's, I think, a lot of our patients post-bariatric, as you know, these are the patients that nobody talks about post-bariatric. I used to be a bariatric surgeon. I'm a recovered bariatric surgeon. Like I, <laughs> and, and I would say, I, I'll talk about the complications. We created some disasters. And, you know, when they were 350 pounds, now they're 70 pounds trying to maintain a little bit of protein in them was very difficult. And we see those in our GI clinic, in our surgery clinic all the time. Beth. Great job, everyone. Um, one of the questions I get asked a lot, and I'd like for you guys to comment on, is for the older <laughs> dietitians in the crowd. Remember how we always had to think about the protein sparing effect of carbohydrate and how many grams per grams of nitrogen? And as we're going to these lower um, hypocaloric feedings, higher protein, that we're actually going to, you know, use those that protein, you know without claving off the amino acid, you know, getting to the carbon backbone, using it for energy. What are your thoughts about that? I think, Juan, you want to take sure. that? Let me start with that, but I would love to hear from others. Uh, we, we've been there. I'm, I'm an old uh, 
person now. I, mean, I have no hair left and my beard is white. Um, and so, so I've tried the protein sparing effect of glucose that you can see in normal individuals. And that paradigm just does not work in our ill patients. When you're sick, it does not work. So we've tried for 50 years. For 50 years, we have had the capacity to feed as many calories as we want. And we have blamed TPN for it, by the way. If you look at our data, TPN is not to blame. What we blame and what we can blame is the excess amount of calories, particularly carbohydrates, that we give to our patients in the first seven days. You see a 30%, almost a 30% benefit in alkaline phosphatase in one week of a, of a standard diet versus a very high protein diet. That has to tell us something. You see a dramatic decrease in hyperglycemic events. You see a decrease in carbon dioxide uh, in those patients. So, so I know that it feels safe to say I'm going to give glucose because it, there's a protein sparing effect of glucose because somebody in the 1940s called man did what we call the castaway experiments and we need to cling to those experiments. That's, a, that's 80 years ago, guys. Okay, it is time to move on. Okay, one last question and then we'll sure. cut it off. Go uh, good morning, I'm Maria Smith from Philadelphia and I want to thank Dr. Juan for the Geisinger trials. I um, just, uh, I use the high protein, uh, low carb feeding in my ICU patients and have seen significant, incredible results with them there. Um, I love those products. And uh, I want to go back to the case study that showed the hypertriglyceride triglyceridemia, and um, in, in our unit, and again, it's a, it's a community hospital, but we have a, a great in intensivist there, and they have switched from propofol to avoid propofol syndrome and the high triglyceridemia. Uh, as soon as we see that triglyceride level going up, it's checked once a week, and we will move to the Presidex to bring it down and have found that successful, and we don't always correlate it with the enteral feeding. We usually correlate it to the medication, and I was just curious in that case study, was that the high triglyceridemia attributed to your high propofol load? So, so actually, I, uh, I brought up propofol because it's such a common bad actor. In our case, we actually, uh, was he was never on propofol. Oh, we okay. actually avoided it altogether because he came in with a high triglyceride count. We and, that was, and actually, that's why what really pushed us that we have to do something else, especially with enteral nutrition, because we did all the other adjuncts and he was still spiking over a thousand. And so it was just kind of an additive thing where we, we I showed you all the, the different modalities and mechanisms. We tried them all and we still weren't working, so we added the, the fibrate, we added, we added the low yeah, fat elemental. Right, uh, and one last question was that, were you also using, uh, in that, that patient is so typical to what I see, it's amazing, but um, again, a, a comment on a thiamine in that person, individual uh, for their uh, he, mental ability. I mean, he, he was on the thiamine as part of our refeeding protocol, but not the probably the excess long-term doses that you use as an adjunct as well. Yeah, like the 500 milligrams yeah. TID. Yeah. I, know. The okay. I know we're protocol. transitioning to our, our system using that, and I, I'm interested to see how it helped. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have to cut it off. I'm sorry. I got a quick question? Real quick. Okay, real quick. Because we got it. We got tons. A three seconds comment. No, at Mayo Clinic, we for our sedation, we're using a lot methadone and um, as, uh, to avoid all IV sedative, uh, propofol, Verset. Um, so, I think it's a, it's a good way. Right. Good, avoid. good thank calm. You. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much for attending this morning. Great session.